In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So today we will continue our story of the history of the society. And of course, it's not an easy thing to put into a short series of sermons because sometimes we focus on one event and sometimes we put a lot of events together. So today we will be looking at the decade that followed the Episcopal consecrations. So we'll be looking, if you will, at the 1990s. And the story of today will begin with the death of the Archbishop, which takes place on the 25th of March, 1991, right at the beginning of that decade. So less than three years after the consecration of the bishops, the Archbishop passes away. This date of the 25th of March, we can see in that a, a kindly choice of providence, because although you probably know, I hope you know, maybe you know, that the 25th of March is the Feast of the Annunciation of Our Lady. Theologically speaking, it is at the Annunciation that our Lord becomes priest. Our Lord, the second person of the Trinity, is the great high priest, as we know, of the New Covenant. But he is high priest because he is man. So God the Father and God the Holy Ghost are not priests. It is because he is both God and man that our Lord is a mediator between the two. So the Christian priesthood is inaugurated, we might say, in the womb of Our Lady on the Annunciation. And so Archbishop Lefebvre, who dedicated his life to the Christian priesthood, uh, passes away on the day, on the anniversary of the day, when that priesthood began, at least, let us say, in as far as the new high priest began his work. Also, traditionally speaking, traditionally speaking, historians debated a bit, but nevertheless, the traditional date of the first Good Friday, when our Lord died on the cross, is the 25th of March. So once again, the Archbishop dedicated his life to the sacrifice, the renewal of the sacrifice of the cross through the Catholic priesthood, and he dies on what is traditionally considered the first Good Friday, the date of the first Good Friday. This decade will see the passing away, not only of the Archbishop, but of what we can think of as the last of the generation of the great priests who carried on the work of tradition at the end of their life. These men who had been formed in seminaries before the Second Vatican Council, who resisted the modernist changes in the church and who tried to carry on the work of tradition, that great generation of priests the last of them passes away during this decade. That seems to be a reasonable way of looking at the, the events of this decade. Bishop de Castro Meyer, this great friend of the Archbishop who had himself co-consecrated the four bishops in 1988, he dies exactly one month after the Archbishop on the 25th of April, 1991. But a great many other priests who were faithful to tradition pass away during this decade. Benedictines and Trappists and Dominicans, as well as, as, as diocesan priests who have been faithful to the mass and, and to the preaching of the true faith. It, it is this, di this, this decade seems the passing away of this first generation of traditional priests. In 1994, we have an important event because it is in that year that Bishop Fillet is elected Superior General, taking over from Father Schmidtberger. Father Schmidtberger had become Superior General even during the life of the Archbishop. The Archbishop had wanted the society to, to work according to its normal way, even though he was still alive. And so Father Schmidtberger had become Superior General even though the Archbishop was still alive. In 1994, Bishop Fillet becomes Superior General and he will keep that post for the next 24 years, which is an enormous length of time to be carrying such a heavy burden. Most of us, I think, um, remember, many of us at least, um, most of our traditional Catholic memory only spans back to, uh, to Bishop Fillet being Superior General. So his, his Calvary, if you will, begins in 1994. During this decade, the society will see immense growth. 
many of the things that we are used to, the places that we are used to, which are part of our, of our idea of where the society is and what it does, it begins during this decade. So Menzingen, the, the general house of the society, becomes precisely the general house during this decade. The expansion of the society's work in Asia is enormous. So we are used to thinking of the Asian district, our neighbor to the north, but most of the groundwork for that, that district is laid during this decade. So the first priory in the Philippines, in Manila, is opened, and it becomes the headquarters of the district. In this same decade, that headquarters will move to Singapore, which is still today the current location. Later in the 1990s, the Brothers Novitiate will be founded at Iloilo in the Philippines. The society expands as well, especially in another area of the East, another kind of East, in Eastern Europe. So from the district of Germany, the society expands eastward into Poland, Lithuania, the Czech Republic, Austria, Hungary, and even visits to Russia begin in the 1990s. It's interesting that places from which we have become used to drawing vocations are first visited and the first masses are established in these places during the 1990s. For example, the German seminary today in, in Zeitzkoven in Germany is full of Lithuanians, Poles, Russians, Czechs, Austrians. We're very used to that. At least in, in Europe, they, they have become quite used to the fact that many, many Eastern Europeans go to our seminary in Germany. But all of that begins with these first forays into this new territory in the 1990s. So too, in Africa, we begin visiting countries in which we now have priories and from which we now have priests. So Kenya is first visited in the 1990s. And in a few weeks' time, we will have our third Kenyan priest for the society. And a little word on that, in case you do not know, you may have heard that there will be no ordinations at Holy Cross this December because we are not able to bring a bishop into the country because of the COVID travel restrictions. And you may be wondering what's going to happen to the deacons because we do have three deacons at Holy Cross right now. So if you haven't heard the news, uh, a solution was found. And uh, later this coming this week, um, this coming week, uh, the three deacons will board a plane and they will fly to South Africa where a bishop will meet them there. And the three deacons will have their ordination retreat and will then be ordained in South Africa. As long as nothing unexpected happens, uh, that solution has been found. So uh, unfortunately, they will not be able to return to Australia for their first masses. So that is a sadness uh, for them, for us as well. But nevertheless, it is a uh, a sadness that is more than compensated for the joy that these three men have. These two Filipinos and this one Kenyan who were not sure at all that they would be able to become priests this year. So please pray for them. As the decade comes to a close, this decade of great growth and expansion for the society, uh, an interesting, a sad, but nevertheless an interesting event happens in the fraternity of St. Peter. At the end of that decade, 16 priests of the Fraternity of St. Peter, they write to Rome complaining that certain priests of their congregation are too attached to the traditional mass. Yes, you heard that right. They were too attached to the traditional mass. In other words, the original founders of the Fraternity of St. Peter, who were former society priests, they are too attached to the traditional mass in the opinion of these 16 Fraternity of St. Peter priests. So they complain to Rome, and Rome decrees that Fraternity of St. Peter priests must, under certain circumstances, offer the new mass and celebrate the new mass, for example, on Holy Thursday. And the superiors of the Fraternity of St. Peter are not allowed to forbid them to do that. Now, I'm sure this is a painful memory for many priests of the Fraternity of St. Peter, and I do not mention it in order to take a cheap shot 
at their congregation. There are certainly good priests in that congregation who I am sure are working very hard and doing the best they can with the understanding of things that they have. But it is important to realize that this happened. And while the fraternity, I think, would like to think of themselves and portray themselves as being just like the Society of St. Pius X, this is an event that is clearly unthinkable in the Society of St. Pius X. When we look at this decade, seeing the passing of this first generation of the old warrior priests for tradition, these priests formed before the council, as well as the continued expansion of the works of the society, we can glean from this observation that in this decade, the society is moving under its own steam. It is doing its work, forming priests, and it is expanding, and it is under the leadership of priests who are themselves the fruit of the society's work of priestly formation. The society is moving ahead and expanding under its own steam. It is at this time, or at least from this point of view, that we can clearly see, or see more clearly, that the society is a work of God and a work of the church, and not merely the work of one man. And let me be very clear what I mean by this and what I don't mean. Certainly, the Archbishop is the founder of the society, and the society is a work of the Archbishop. It is always the case that a religious congregation is the work of someone whom God raises up, to whom God gives special graces, and the, the good results of that congregation flow, to some extent, from that original grace given to the founder. All I mean to say is that a congregation raised up by God is not a merely human work. That is what I mean when I say it is not the work of a mere man. So the society and every religious congregation, if it survives, if it prospers after its founder has passed away, it is a sign that it is something more than the genius and the expertise of the founder that is at work. Because merely human works, merely human works do depend on merely human factors. But merely human works partake in the nature of all things human. They pass, they go away, they fade. And it is seen clearly in that fading away that they were merely human. Last week I, I quoted, in my last sermon I quoted these words of the Acts of the Apostles that we must obey God rather than men, sometimes at least when we are placed in that predicament. Another word from the Acts of the Apostles, if this be the work of men it will come to naught. And that is so true. And so what lesson can we draw? We're always looking to take a lesson for our own spiritual lives from these reflections on our history. Well, we can draw this, that human gifts, human gifts have no power to produce supernatural results. And we must be very deeply convinced of this because we can stand in awe of the human gifts of another. We can unfortunately stand in awe of our own human gifts. That's another problem, but human gifts in themselves, however impressive they may be, they have no power to produce supernatural results. Of themselves, they are as likely to work evil as they are to work good. The human side is not enough, and human zeal, for that matter, is likewise not enough. Human zeal is likely to go astray like any other merely human quality. It is the grace of God that matters. It is a supernatural cause which brings about supernatural results. And it is so important to remember that it is not enough to have a merely human zeal. And God gives his grace, this grace which must penetrate our zeal. 
which must saturate our zeal. God gives that grace for the works that he chooses. It is the will of God which determines the graces that God gives. Often, and, and it's, it's, it's obviously understandable that it can be like this, but often we have an idea of something good, and it indeed would seem to be something good, no, no problem. But is it the will of God? That is really the overriding question, because that unless it is the will of God, there will be no grace to support this idea we have, this venture that we have in mind. Because the grace of God is not simply something that is at the service of our human whims or our human prejudices or our personal agendas. It doesn't work that way. God has merited grace for the works that he wills. He distributes grace for the works that he wills. And so our zeal must be a supernatural one and an enlightened one. And there we return to that very first lesson that we had in our first consideration about the society, the importance of not only generosity, but also of docility. Also of docility. It is a good idea, but the important question is, does God will it? That is the question we must always ask ourselves. And the first way that we discern the will of God is to look at our duty of state. And the devil will always tempt us to think that the duty of state is over here and the will of God is over there. And the two things don't match up. And that is not true. Our first way of discerning the will of God is to be faithful to our duty of state. And then after that, if we have an idea, we have what we think is an inspiration, well then we can see about doing a little bit extra. Is there something extra I can do for the kingdom of God? But in order to discern whether it be the will of God, since it no longer is something I can be sure of, because it doesn't fall squarely within my duty of state, to be sure that it is the will of God, I have to follow the order of God. I have to seek advice. I have to consult those whom God gives me to help discern the will of God and to be docile to their advice. So we will leave it there. I will encourage you to reread the epistle of today. St. Paul writing to the Colossians is trying to teach this very lesson. What does he will for them? He says, what I want for you is to have a real wisdom, to have a real knowledge of what the will of God is. And then you can be fruitful in every good work using the help that God supplies, that God supplies for the accomplishment of his own will. So I encourage you, reread. It's so short. It's so short. Reread at least once today the epistle for today's Mass. It is the grace that St. Paul asked for those faithful that he's writing to. And because the Church has taken this epistle for her liturgy today, it is the grace that the Church asks for all of us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.